Thank you. <laughs> um, we're going to go ahead and get started with this rich conversation. I'm so excited to be here with you all tonight to talk about a genre that is foundational to my life, and I'm sure um, a favorite of so many of you here. I'm going to ask all of my fellow panelists to come join me, and I will share a little bit more about them. Lisa McClendon, Bishop McKissick, radio announcer, promoter all the things, Freddie Rose. Can we give them a round of applause as they come? Oh, you're here. Come on down. So I'm going to open by reading a little bit more about each of you and asking you an opening question. First, I would like to introduce Lisa McClendon, who emerged on the music scene in the early 2000s with her debut album, My Diary, Your Life, reshaping the gospel music landscape with elements of soul and jazz and gospel. You quickly became known as the queen of gospel neo-soul. Did you know that? No. <laughs> uh, currently, Lisa McClendon serves as a community advocate, uh, merging gardening, art, and mindfulness to empower youth and continues to travel the world, bringing to the stage musical inspiration and feel-good vibes that heal and uplift the soul. So welcome, Lisa, to this conversation. My opening question for you, I was thinking about you a lot with um, the clip of Mahalia Jackson, because she was so intentional about how she brought songs forward, but listened to the music of her time and sort of what was around in her community and all of that. And I feel like there's a lot of synthesis, both in your music and in your branching out to include things like gardening and all of that. But if you could tell us a little bit about what made your approach to gospel and how you entered gospel and brought all of yourself and all that you were hearing to it. All right. Hey, Jacksonville. <laughs> um, so I'm a transplant. So um, for me, it's special because this city embraced me when I, I wasn't even a native of Duval. <laughs> um, so I was originally born in Palatka, Florida. Shout out um, to Palatka. Come on now. Let's, this is what we're doing. Um, so when I came here um, to answer your question, um, my parents, who are both ministers, my father was a preacher and my mother was a, a minister as well, but they always allowed me to explore music. Um, and so I grew up, in addition to the gospel music, I grew up on Ella Fitzgerald. Um, I grew up on all the old classics, um, movie classics and stuff. And so my music was really um, influenced by jazz, by soul, because my mother allowed, her thing was just watch the words. She would always say that, watch what they're saying. If it's not something crazy, I'm going to let you listen. And so they would go on church conferences and bring me back Mika Parrish and Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong CD. I mean, my parents did that for me. And it was great because it allowed me to just be me. And so when I met Mo Henderson, um, who is an amazing producer, who actually helped put Jacksonville on the map in gospel um, in, the, in the space of neo soul, hip hop, he's just an amazing human being. He got me and he let me be what was in me. And I, I could hear it in my head. I had never really heard it. Um, at that time I heard um, Kurt was the closest thing. I wanna say even Mary Mary, um, but it was still, it wasn't on the neo soul vibe, but I was like hooked on Erica Badu and I was hooked on Jill Scott. And, and that time that was, I, P.J. Morton, come on now. And, and actually, when I saw P.J. Morton, he was the closest thing that was in my head. And it was almost like he gave me permission to be me in gospel. Because I'm like, I'm doing gospel, but it doesn't sound like. And so that was my space to do it. And, and it's been embraced. So and I'm, just, I'm just honored that Jacksonville embraced me and allowed me to do what I do the way I do what I do. Indeed. And keep that up. Welcome. Next, we have Bishop Rudolph McKissick, Jr. Round of applause. <laughs> Bishop McKissick is a senior pastor of Bethel Church located right here in Jacksonville, Florida. Bethel is the oldest existing Baptist church in the state of Florida, being founded in, we can clap for the history, yes. <laughs> Being founded in 1838, so coming up on 200 years in the wow. district. 
didn't do it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, under Bishop McKissick's leadership, the church has experienced exponential growth to over 10,000 active disciples. Bishop McKissick has established himself not only as a prolific proclaimer, but also as an academician, teaching as an adjunct professor at the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School, the famed Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Religion at Virginia Union University. Bishop McKissick is the author of several books and an accomplished musician with several critically acclaimed music projects. Welcome, Bishop McKissick. Good evening, good evening. Yes. My question to you is, how do you see, as a, as a pastor, as a preacher, and as a musician, how do you see the relationship between sermon and song? That is such a good question. First of all, I'm honored to be a part of this amazing panel. I, I think uh, the relationship and the synergy between uh, music and message is something that that has always been a part of the black church experience. Um, in the earlier days of the black church, the preacher was a narrative preacher who would simply retell the biblical story and then in a kind of symbolic way compare what they were going to through to the disenfranchisement of our people. And the songs were songs of triumph. Uh, they were solical, not just lyrical. They, 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 they were a part of the pathos of our experience. And so when this preacher would come behind that music, it would almost be like accentuating what was just in song. Um, I think the other thing that's important in the synergy of it is it's not music and preaching is not just the retelling of a story, but it is also the shaping of a theology. For, for, for the black church experience, the music was about a God who came down and intervened on our behalf. It wasn't like our, our European brothers and sisters whose music was always about a God who was up and we ascend to worship him. No, for us, it was about a God who bent down and came down, not just in Jesus, but who came down and was on, in the words of James Cone, on the side of the oppressed. And so the preacher would then come behind that and accentuate that. So there, there was always this synergy and partnership that was inspirational and solical and not just musical. And uh, I, you know, I'm sure we'll get into more of that because I think we've lost some of that in, in some of the music of today. That's why I like Neo Soul so much because it's solical and it's not just lyrical. And so that, it, that relationship between preacher as messenger and choir as music has always been important uh, for the message we were conveying to the people about this God who once again in the words of James Cone has his own affirmative action plan <laughs> who blesses from the bottom and all the way up. So that was always important. And thank you. Aren't y'all glad y'all in the house tonight? <laughs> this not on the documentary. <laughs> Last and certainly not least, we have Freddie Rhodes. Freddie Rhodes, oh, we can clap. Yes. Freddie Rhodes hosts the Afternoon Power Drive on Victory AM 1360 and FM 94.7 weekdays from 2 to 6 p.m. He also serves as the station's vice president of programming. Freddie's interest in radio began while he was in high school. The legendary Adrian Ken Knight was one of the biggest names in black radio during that era, gave Freddie his first job in radio on Sunday nights doing gospel. Even though Freddie's desire was to do a gospel radio show, he accepted an on-air shift doing R&B. But after a while, Freddie decided to give that up and return to his first love, gospel music. 
In 2014, he was named the Rhythm of Gospel Announcer of the Year from the, from the National Independent Gospel Music Association. Welcome, Mr. Freddie Rhodes. My question to you is, can you help us understand the importance of the gospel radio announcer and DJ, the critical role that you have and continue to serve in? Well, yes, thank you again for inviting me to come to be a part of this fantastic group of panelists. Clearly the voice. Evening. I love it. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> First of all, I, I, I truly has been a blessing uh, since 19, right out of the high school, Eugene J. Butler High School, 1968. Uh, you mentioned earlier, Ken Knight, one of the biggest names in black gospel radio during that time, took me on his wings and uh, brought me into uh, gospel radio. And uh, one of the things I, I like to say, I'm, I really, truly thank God for is that from then up until now, I am still doing radio, gospel radio broadcasting, which has seemed to be going away because so much computer modern technology have really done away with the quote we used to say DJ, but we don't call ourselves DJ, we are gospel radio announcers. So it seemed to be such a, a dinosaur these days in time, but by transcend, transcending the, the times and being able to just relate, we want that voice behind the microphone playing the music, introducing the music, setting it up so it could be a blessing to the masses who tune in every day. And, uh, you know, there's so many different types of music. Like, I was enjoying the clip from James Cleveland. You know, it was one of my favorite songs back in the day, you know, Peace Be Still. But, and I thought about even today, one of his songs, he sung another song, said, God is. And how it transcended the time we were talking earlier about how you get, we got another gospel artist, a young guy, a Melvin Crispell III. He took James Cleveland's song, God is, and put a spin on it. And I'm just saying how gospel music from back then come up to now how it has really got the same message, the same song, really. He said using the same words, but it's appealing now to a young audience. And by me being in radio, I have to really uh, try to, I can grab the older listeners as well as grab the Yaga plays of Neo Soul. I like your music now. I can get, a, you know, Ty Tribbett, Dietrich Haddon, you know, Kirk Franklin. I love all those. I play, I play it all the time. So at, at my age, people say, you really like that music? Yes, I love it. I love it. Thank you. Well, welcome. We're glad to have you here. I have a question I'd like to hear each of you answer in your own way. The documentary talks about um, gospel in cities like Chicago or Detroit. Um, but what is gospel here in Jacksonville? Oh, I could tackle that right quick. You know, you know what? Uh, Jacksonville, uh, like we have a lot of quartets, even the, in the documentary, quartets were mentioned. Quartet music is, is really still alive because there's such an audience for it. Uh, a lot of the, I, I noticed that a lot of younger people are grasping the quartet sound uh, of gospel music. We've got a lot of young gospel quartets out there these days. So it's, um, you know, it's just a great appeal to even everybody. And, uh, and like, like I said, even though you don't hear that much on radio, but here in Jacksonville, we, we know that there's an audience for it. So we program music to reach those people to really enjoy quartet music. Now, for me, it was very different. <laughs> the church that I was born and raised in, my father passed it before me, um, was very erudite. Um, Rosamond Johnson, who uh, provided the music for the poem of his brother, was the organist at Bethel. We had a tracker pipe organ. Um, and so our, our services were very liturgical. I'm talking, you know, Hallelujah from the Mount of Olives, Inflammatus, uh, The Seven Last Words by Dubois. Stuff everybody here is probably like, what is he talking about? <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> so I did not really hear a lot of gospel music. I say that to say that even in the black church in Jacksonville, there was this diversity of music. Um, there was there was this intellectualism, I don't even know if I want to call it that, I shouldn't call it that, but there was this high church, let me put it that way, 
this high church musicology that, that you had at the Bethels and the AMEs and the like. So when I grew up, when I heard gospel music, it was like, oh, they don't really know what real music is. <laughs> you, you, you know, I did not really discover the power of gospel music until Bethel started evolving and different people started coming into Bethel under my dad's leadership. And then all of a sudden I, I started hearing James Cleveland. I started hearing some of the Roberta Martins singer songs and, and yeah, and Clara Ward. And what I noticed was the reactions got different. Mm -hmm. You know, when they, when the choir would finish singing Hallelujah from the Mount of Olives, everybody would just clap. Oh, that was, that was so good. When, when gospel got introduced in Bethel, then you'd have a, a deaconess, Mary Jones, who'd get up and start screaming. <laughs> you know, so there was, <laughs> there was that diversity in, in Jacksonville where if, if you were in a certain kind of church, you were on an island and didn't really even know that this other gospel existed unless you snuck out and, and, you know, and went to these other churches and heard this, this other music. It was just really, so it was foreign to us at Bethel. It ain't now, but it was then. <laughs> so to be genuinely who I am, I have to speak to the younger um, part of gospel because I came here in the 2000s. So all the stuff that bitch would talk about, I don't know nothing about that. <laughs> Be you, girl. I, wa I, wasn't here. I wasn't here yet. So I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm, sure. <laughs> so the representation that I can speak to for Jacksonville is the young um, Petty D, okay? Um, Camp Quest. Um, Lisa McClendon, of course. Um, come on, Lisa McClendon, of course. Of course. Come on, God. Um, but even now, John Lumpkin, who is a gospel jazz. So I just thought about it. We haven't even spoken about the gospel jazz. So even though um, my good friend Ulysses says he's not, he doesn't, he's a jazz artist, we do have representation of jazz in gospel yes. through artists like that, um, Joshua Bolin. So it is, so my answer would be, it is kind of what Bishop was saying, diversity. It's a melting pot. Mm -hmm. It's like, it makes me proud because... If I'm correct, I think gospel music is the only genre that has several genres within one genre. It has all these subcultures, cultures in the culture of gospel, which I think makes gospel more unique than any other genre of, of music because it is so many types and it's welcome. So you want some country? We got some country gospel. And, it, and it's my aunt, my aunt is a black country gospel artist, Jay Lee. Um, she's been for 20-something years. So it is out there. So whatever kind of genre you want, you can find that in gospel music. And I think Jacksonville is a great re representation of that. All the cross-sections of these sub-genres. That makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense. I'm going to, I had, I had not thought of this question until I listened to the answers that you all are giving. This is something that I see pop up on social media a lot. A lot of people say the quality of popular music has, black popular music has deteriorated a little bit because um, there aren't as many singers in the popular realm who come out of the church. Like I see that on like just across social media platforms very often. What do you make of the relationship between gospel music as like this reservoir of uh, genius and talent and how it goes out and feeds, do you see a relationship between those two things, or how do you imagine that? <laughs> well, I will say one, when you talk about genres of music, whether it be R&B, hip hop, and all of those, none of them happen without gospel, because gospel is at the foundation of all of them. I think, Technology has done a lot to hide and fool talent. Well. Um, this is a safe space. So, <laughs> this is a safe space. Auto-tune 
and and you know you can go into a studio now and and fly over you know uh vocals and you can you can put a whole nother group on the album that wasn't the group that was singing and uh so why y'all made me go first um and so a, a lot of real musicians now are lacking because it doesn't take much to be a musician now. Uh, you know, it, it, you don't really have to sing that well. Somebody will take you in the studio and they'll fix you up. You don't even have to read music. Just transpose. And most of them that transpose don't even know what the word transpose means. I don't know why they put me on this panel. It's <laughs> um, a deep one. <laughs> so I, I think, you know, we have lost something. I really do. And you, you, you can tell it in not all, but in much of the music we hear today. It, it has no heart. Mm. Not all of it. And there's, there is, you're starting to see a return, thankfully. But a, a, it has become more, you know, gospel music used to be for the inspiration of black people who spent all week long in systemic oppression. And the church was the one place, like our ancestors, who would leave the slave balcony and go to the sacred space where they would create their own songs, like over my head, I hear music in the air. Go down Moses. They weren't talking about Moses. <laughs> they talking about that slave owner. And then the gospel music, it was inspiration. Now it has become business. Mm -hmm. So that you have, you have your business manager and your team and your producer who forces you now to fit into a style that will sell as opposed to you singing from your soul, mm -hmm. from your experience. So now the artist is making money but not making inspiration. I'll stop right there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, I'm, I'm thinking maybe it's because they are trying to, like you say, it's money. They're just trying to reach a larger audience, you know, by changing the flavor of many of our songs. Like you said, the spirit is, I could think of a whole lot of songs and artists that you really don't feel uh, uh, the power of gospel in their presentation. So I think it's, they're trying to reach out and grab, you know, the people who normally listen to R&B so that they can make that money. Um, you know, trying to not mention the Jesus or Lord Knight. They did it back in the day, you would hear that. But now it's just... We're going to be mainstream to try to reach those other people. Um, I think I'm just going to bandwagon Bishop a lot tonight because <laughs> I'll be thinking something and he'll be going like right in that direction. Um, it's funny because as I was driving here today, um, yesterday, I was thinking about a conversation I had with a friend of mine who's a producer. And I had sent him the song that I wanted to work on. And he said to me, he was like, well, that's not what they're doing now. Now, mind you, I just wrote this for my soul. Yes. I literally, I remember, I remember feeling the power of God in that booth while I was, right while I was recording those words, wow. just talking about embracing that you're not perfect. Because that's something that, which is, a, which is why they do what they do with electronic, because they want to be perfect. Um, and it, and it broke, and it broke me because I was like, there was a time that I would sit in church and hear the bishop speaking, and I would get inspiration from the word to write a song based on what I was going through in my own life. Now you telling me I can't do this song because it's not in style, because it needs to sound like this. So now it's like it's taking music to it's actually at the point where it's all about money, and. And it's that war. Even, even now, my son is recording music now. He said, Mom, come listen to this. <laughs> and it sounded like another artist. What he did was use AI to take his voice 
He sang the person's song, and then he used AI to change the sound of his voice to sound like the artist Joji. And I said, Josh, that's not you. He's like, no, mom, that's Joe. That's no, he said, yes, mama, that's me. But I sound like Joji. And I'm like, that's scary. That's terrifying. So we are in an age now where why not, while technology, it can be a great thing, I feel like it's watered down the value of stuff. It's taking away the, the depth. Like I went, into, I went into the studio a couple of years ago to record a song. I had, had been a while, and to Bishop's point, I walked in. So you have to understand, if you, if you know the relationship between Maurice um, Henderson and I, my producer, he would, I was known for stacking. There's a term we call stacking. Our artists would go, go in the booth and they would stack vocals. I mean, we, we would spend hours just on stacking. Take the soprano note, for those, take the soprano note and we're gonna sing it 12 times until we get the right one then we'll pull the old ones. And you would do that process. So if you have five different notes, you have to do every last one of them 12 times. You see, you see me? I go in the studio and, I'm ch and he was like, all right, we good. I said, wait, 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 I got a stack, don't I? I'm looking through the booth. I got a stack, right? He's like, oh, no, I'm just copy and paste it. Copy and paste? What? He said, hold on one second. In two minutes, this dude took my one voice and copied and pasted and made it sound like so many of me. And I felt, I, I felt like I didn't, I felt like I didn't work. You didn't sign up for that. I was like, I felt like I'm robbing the people. But I mean, it's cool, but it just, to me, I like the old way. It's something about my raw vocals singing every song and it's not being perfect. I like the old way and I just think the, the new way has a place, but sometimes everything new ain't right. You know, everything new ain't good, so. You know, the perfect, at least it's the perfect example. When I hear some music, all I hear is a production. When I hear Lisa's music, I hear an experience. And I think, that's what's missing in a lot of gospel music today, that we have lost the authenticity of the experience birthing the song. Because that's what gospel music used to be. And that's what um, sticks to us about so many of the gospel songs that we love. And you mentioned quartets are coming back here in Jacksonville because... You know, I remember I grew up on Cortez. My grandfather was in the gospel quartet. That stuff sticks to you. It I did gets too. you through, right? It gets you through. I guess that's what I'm doing. Come on now. <laughs> and so I'm thinking about um, how though you know I grew up. At, I'm an '80s '90s kid, and all the R&B singers I like first started out in Cortez. They knew how to sing to get mm -hmm. a gospel choirs, like, and and ha learning how to harmonize and listen in order to be able to harmonize. And so you know. Um, I do get concerned sometimes that, you know, there are too many shortcuts that are being made available, to your point. But since since we went to that side, I want to bring it back to the other side a little bit. What um, makes you hopeful and excited about where gospel music is today? Are there artists that you are um, finding that do have that experience, that lived experience in their music, or is it your own music that, and, and the prospect of saying what you need to say about your own life that makes you excited, or are there glimmers of things that in the genre that um, you want to point our direction to? And I'm not saying this just because they're performing tonight. Meacham Clark. Um, Meacham's writing is a throwback great choir music. What makes me hopeful is the Meacham Clarks, the Sean Tillery's of the world. There is, there is a return to, to choir music that makes me hopeful, you know, that makes me very hopeful um, for the future of gospel music. There, there, there is, Neo Soul to me is just passion. That makes you hopeful. You know, I'm, I'm hearing less and less of just music that I can listen to and tell it was produced to make money. And I'm hearing more and more music that is being produced of experience and the return of choir music. So for me, that's what makes me hopeful 
that gospel music is, is not being put out to Jurassic Park. <laughs> Indeed. You know, that's a great comeback, and Bishop mentioned about the choir, and bringing back the choir. We got, uh, you know, just released, we got Reverend, uh, the, the, there's a, so many new, Vincent Bohannon, who's one of the hottest gospel artists in the country, bringing the choir sound back. And of course, you know, you got your old standards anyway, but there is a, there's a trend to bring it back. You know, the more music I play at the radio station, the Chicago Mass Choir, mm -hmm. just still, after all these years, you know, they are still putting out brand new music. So, you know, I go back to when I first started, you know, in radio, I have to play a variety of music. So because I know the choirs, I know your, your Tat Tributes, your Dietrich Haddon's, uh, your Mary and Mary and your Bree Bobbinos. I love that music. I even get down with some of that Maverick City music, you know, which is, um, which is really appealing to everybody. So I play all that too, you know. So then I may play uh, some Maverick City music, go back to play the Mighty Clouds of Joy, somewhere down in, the, in my rotation of music to reach that genre of people who really, though, who really enjoy that genre of music. I would like to see quartet music make a comeback. <laughs> I'm I with would. you. I mean, my dad played in the quartet gr growing up, and I think it's just the ode to my father, um, who passed away, left us last year. Um, and I think that resonates with me because I think it just brings me closer to him. But I just remember Willie Neal Johnson, gospel in the gospel keynotes, the soul stirrers, <laughs> the Johnson, come on, <laughs> the, the Williams brothers, um, just resounding through my house on the 8-track. Come on, y'all don't know nothing about that. Um, y'all don't know nothing about the 8-track. <laughs> the big fat cassette? Come on, now. Um, I would love to see that emerge again. Um, and I would, I would love to see more jazz, just that soft, laid back. Um, and I would probably love to hear more hymns. Finding a unique way, a unique way to bring hymns back. You know, I, would, I think that'll be, I would love to see that. I hear your answer like a, a balance between, and most of your answer, like the balance between what we carry forward yeah. from the past, but leaving room for new expressions or new interpretations, yes. you know, exactly. of, of this, this literal bridge that's brought us over. Um, yeah. 